Welcome to the Arena Decklist Podcast. I'm Jerry Thompson, joined by Brian Gottlieb. And we have a pseudo top 10 show for y'all for Phyrexia All Will Be One. And it's going to be weird, Brian. I just know that when you go to the podcasting book of records, which is a very real thing, um, we have now set the all-time record for most frameworks for a top 10 show of any podcast ever. We have, we have, is that a bad thing? Every, no, it's a good thing. It shows that we are endlessly creative, always looking to improve, always striving for greatness in our top 10 lists. And uh, yet another one we're going to present to you this go around. And it's kind of silly because this is also a framework that I don't think we're ever going to use again, but well, it's okay yeah. because it just is furthering that record, man. Just getting more points. Yeah, on the board. You just got to get like another, another notch right yes and we're we're definitely going to do that so i don't know it, it basically it depends oh, this is dude this is the same as when you tell me to rate something one through ten right yes and, but i i just have to quantify and clarify and preface everything um i think at some point we kind of like lost our way from trying to do like quote unquote good top 10 lists versus uh I don't know, cards we liked that also were pretty good or whatever. Mm -hmm. And I kind of just want to like tighten it, tighten it up again. And I think that there are a lot of ways that we can do that. And we talked a little bit before the show about pros and cons of that. And certainly uh, you had some very good points, but I think, I think that we can kind of accomplish it all. We just have to be a little bit more methodical in our thinking and the way that we go about things. And I I don't think it's going to be like, more work or anything necessarily um but hopefully it leads to like the list being like a little bit better and then maybe a little bit more structured too and then also in the following week we can do uh some stuff about like things that we've been working on for things that are like honorable mentions uh things that look like they have a pretty high ceiling but don't necessarily crock crack the top 10 list because of ubiquity uh just like if this shows up which we're not even sure it's going to do it's even just going to be in one deck and then even then maybe not even in high numbers right it's like that's not a top 10 level card right i think it's all about framing right one of the interesting things about those type of cards that you're discussing is that if they hit they can often like go on to define a format and so missing them seems like well you know, this card clearly powerful, isn't it going to go on and define things? And the one that I keep coming back to as an example of this is something like Emergent Ultimatum, right? Like Emergent Ultimatum as a card had all the potential in the world, didn't deliver on that potential for a very long time, ultimately got the pieces around it where it sort of defined the standard format. Should that have been on the top 10 list at number one? I I don't think so. Like, you, cause you end up with a lot of spots where just like the card you put as your number one in the card in the set never matters whatsoever. Just never does anything. Um, right. What's, what's more like useful, I think is if you identify those cards and one of the good things about having a stretched out preview season, like we've had is we've had time to identify those cards in our previous shows. So I don't feel as bad leaving them off our top 10 list. Cause a lot of times they're just something I want to talk about, right? Like I want to acknowledge the potential, I've done that already. We've had a f- several shows on this set now, and we've we've gotten to say our piece on these cards. So I'm much more comfortable here going with the more focused approach. We basically got to talk about everything, although I did notice a few things that I just somehow completely missed uh, when going through and trying to figure out what our what my top 10 list was going to be. Yeah. Uh, I just saw a card that I'd never seen before, which we are going to talk about at some point. So I was like, huh, that's weird. But uh, all right. I don't know how this happened, but cool. Maybe it's because there's like 10 versions of every card and it was like sandwiched in between them and I just yep, skipped them. Very possible. Know. Very possible. Uh, but yeah, I mean, I, I think trying to get the list to a point where it's not just dual lands and removal spells and mana creatures, like those cards are obviously impactful, but they they are also obviously so, yep. right? In a lot of instances. In and, the set in particular, there's there's like good candidates in all those spots for sure. Right. So those are not on the list. Also not on the list. We have not talked about actual reprints. Well, this set has like some functional reprints in it Mm -hmm. too. And uh, Evolving Adaptive is not quite Experiment 1. It's not strictly better. It has pros and cons. Uh, You can't 
do like plus one plus one counter synergy stuff with it uh you can't regenerate from a sweeper uh but there is just like a lot of oil matter stuff and like proliferate stuff so like in this standard versus evolving one standard i think evolving adaptive is probably going to be better but it's not going to make the list because it's a functional reprint in my eyes yep i agree with that assessment entirely there's uh, a a lot fewer playable green one drops these days than there were when uh experiment one came around and i think that is intentional like green is supposed to be a little bit weak at that point on the curve so when you get a solid one it really matters a lot just think about you know mono green aggro very important deck in standards past the last last few standards and just struggling to fill that one drop slot uh we, so we have the teething wormling yep name is something along those lines we have we have a lone lion and I think there was another like semi-aggressive one drop when I was building my decks. I, I vaguely remember thinking that I could play like eight aggro one drops or like Lone Lion and some other stuff if I wanted to. But uh, I, like the things were there. It's just like, well, you have okay creatures all across the curve, but what do you have to like really push through or like what is actually giving you an edge? And I didn't think that they had it. And I don't think that Evolving Adaptive on its own actually gives them that but like the rest of the set might have some tools to mm -hmm. help along with that. Mm -hmm. so fair enough that's cool um the other one is uh shieldred's edict and if you listen to the last few episodes you know that we just hyped up edicts so much and uh like river tears charm i like a lot because it automatically gets the biggest thing right yep. and i i liked soul shatter a lot for the same reason and I don't know. Th this one kind of does that sort of thing where it's like sack a non-token where normally the token is the fodder that you keep around for the edict or whatever. So it's it's better than just like a diabolic edict would be and also has, you know, the planeswalker stuff going on for it, too. So uh, very, very good, but also like kind of a functional reprint, also a removal spell like stuff that we've seen before. Like, is it going to be good? Absolutely. Yeah, ex I think extremely good. I think getting that planeswalker clause is kind of a game changer for these edict effects and a little bit of a game changer for planeswalkers as well since that first planeswalker you drop down always going to be vulnerable to this spell it feels like the type of thing that it was needed in previous planeswalker centric metagames and i am i am happy that this is a tool that we've been given access to a hugely impactful card also pretty boring like not all that exciting what are you what are you going to say about it it destroys stuff so yeah, I mean, imagine our top 10 list if it's like, yeah, one mana, three, three, two mana removal spell, uh, five fast lands. And it's like, yeah, we're done here. Look at us. Yeah, we're so pack smart. It we're in. good. Pack it uh, in. The problem with kind of all these caveats is that then I start making a top 10 list and there's like seven cards I'm pretty happy to be there. And then the rest are sort of in that honorable mention space where it's like, is this actually going to hit and be super impactful? I don't know. Uh, so we are disqualifying a lot of the cards and then maybe the bottom end of this list is a little weird, but also in previous top 10 lists, we've kind of like doubled up on cards that are functionally doing the same thing. It's like an archetype needs both of these to be successful, but like they're both making our top 10 list. And I think we started, uh, condensing that a little bit as time went on. And there, there's so many things in this set that are good but also synergy based yeah packages so, yeah like it, almost everything is a package and then even things like tyranax rex is like well you know if you're playing that you might be playing some thruns too and like certain metagames are going to call for one instead of the other maybe so it's also weird talking about one and not the other um but a lot of these things are just based on synergy to the point where you kind of have to talk about like everything that's that's going on right so a lot of these things too are like, well, this, but also with these other cards that are in the set. I think that's fine. I think the most important thing is just give a picture of the set, its impact and, and where we're headed. And this setup is very well positioned to do that. And from the overall make of the set, the other thing that I thought I could do was just talk big picture and like, yes, cards that will be impactful, but also just archetypes that will be impacted and could get better. And I think it is uniquely good for a set like this because, again, a lot of these cards are 
based around packages. It's not like, oh, here's Thrag Tusk. What do you do with it? Well, whatever the hell you want. You know, it's like a lot of these cards are pretty pointed towards certain archetypes. So it's easy to talk about them in that regard too. So I could see that as maybe a thing we do going forward. It does feel like there's a bit of a goal shift with this set. And it, it's really hard to put my finger on, but it it feels like it's delivering uh, a little bit more on archetype packages and less on sheer ridiculous card stats and um you know ridiculous legends that just define the game immediately although there are several of those on this list <laughs> smaller in size for whatever reason but yeah uh, it, it does still feel quite different from previous sets to me i think this has been the case for the last few years and you could point to like Oko Uro sort of stuff where it's like, you know, quote unquote fire design and power creep and blah, blah, blah. But this is sort of power creep, but not in an egregious way where it's like a lot of these colors just have really good two mana removal spells and really yeah. good aggressive one drops. And they're all sort of fitting into the set's themes, which is cool and good. But uh, also, a lot of these things can like go back to Pioneer potentially, right? Yeah. So that, that's sort of like the upside of that too. And I, I like this a lot. It just a lot of the stuff in the set is exciting because of things like that. Like a lot of these cards are aggressively costed, but not game breaking. And I think that that is just good design. And if, you know, standard becomes, well, if standard becomes a format, that would be cool. But if it becomes a format where things are pushed a little bit more, but not in the Oko Uro space, I'm pretty happy about that. And same same thing with draft too, man. Honestly, like I I've said this about draft for a while is just like it's not super exciting to be attacking with just like grizzly bears and train armadons and have some giant gross and whatever. Obviously, that's super reductive. Uh, all of you diehard draft folks, like you know, don't come at me or anything, but for a spectator all of that is pretty boring like that is not the stuff that that sells you on magic and i guess i didn't even think that we were going to talk about this but getting into the whole like how do you hook a new player kind of thing it's just like you got to give them like the shiv and dragons and like the cool exciting badass stuff right 100 percent. there has to be i said for a long time one of the best things you can do in like intro magic project pro products is a cool combo, an infinite combo, something that just makes the game feel bigger and opens up all the possibilities. And uh, the grizzly bear combat scenario is not the possibility that it's going to blow someone's mind. The I made, not initially, not initially. Yeah, that's that's like a two not. years in thing, yep. right? Yep, one hundred percent. You have to do something a little flashier, and and this set does. And you know what's funny about this set? If this came out and it was it was a pioneer master set, I'd kind of be like. Oh, this hit on a lot of points, like a really good, solid Pioneer Master set, which is interesting because it's like, is that actually the goal now? Are you are you designing for these non-rotating formats as opposed to standard and you let the standard chips fall where they may? And if you asked me like what the correct thing to do, given the popularity of standard, that makes a lot more sense to me. Like just design for your non-rotating formats instead and let standard just sort itself out. Yeah. And if Oko happens or whatever, where standard is miserable and it actually matters then you ban it address it right yep. but uh i think that there's some good stuff for pioneer uh we are mostly going to be talking in the lens of standard still but it, it's like a little underpowered compared to what i would hope for for like an actual pioneer set but yes there there are some things where it's like yeah give us good one drops give us like the fast lands that pioneer did not have before this is awesome. removal spells like i i think it's it's there in a lot of ways like uh, certainly it, it's not a complete master set you would turn it up a little bit and, and take some more shots but right right uh it, it does feel like a, a bent in that direction yeah the the mythics would not be like four and five mana creatures right, right. they would they would be like weirdo artifact enchantment like bomby type of yep. things build around stuff and like there that. is some of that here i just don't think they quite reach that power level yeah. for the yep. most part with maybe one or two exceptions yep so all of that preamble aside uh i have i have 10 cards uh a little hesitation there because it's more like 16 cards but 
Uh, I want to talk about those 10. You also built just like your own kind of top 10 list in sort of our, our old style, I suppose, where it was just like cards that you think are going to be impactful and it was in different places. But like a, a lot of those cards are on my list too. Mm -hmm. Yeah, right? good amount of overlap here. And that makes sense because I had a, a very easy time finding like seven or eight standouts from this set. Yeah. And it's different than previous experiences where you go like, oh, there's 30 cards that can make this list. There really weren't like I, there weren't that many cards I was working my way through. Um, and, and the gap between like the top seven and the rest was pretty pronounced. So in interesting distribution of power in this set. I had 16, I guess. Um, my first draft was 12 and cutting down to 10 was, was pretty easy from there. OK. Interesting. Well, you can tell me what you hate about my list. Uh, this is not in any particular order. Okay. Just I FYI. That, that's the first thing I hate. Okay. Uh, then you order them. Tell me what's number 10. Uh, number 10 will be... Oh, this is a lot of pressure. Uh, Kemba Ka Enduring is the number 10 card on this I list. I knew it. One of the ones that you did not ha have on your list. Brian, you know yeah. that we have, we have poo-pooed equipment for, for so long. long. Time. Yeah. Oh, no. I spelled, I spelled Kemba wrong. Oh, there's no H. It's just K E. Like Kemba Walker, famous Yukon Husky. Okay. I believe you. Uh yeah, we've we've poo-pooed equipment for so long. And there's three cards at rare. I think they're all rare, that all look pretty decent. But the the question has always been like, what is the support like? And based on the reconfigure stuff is that the right name for the keyword like yes rabbit theory? yep uh like that stuff in previous sets and then a lot of uh four mirin equipments some of them are pretty decent uh i think that equipment might actually be a thing but like it's weird because then i still look at it and it's like okay you have like a curve and you have payoffs and you have reasonable equipment lying around because like the equipment come with creatures attached. Brilliant. Brilliant solve, right? Uh, is this actually better than just like a mono soldiers. red deck or a green red deck? Yeah, soldiers. Like soldiers was the first thing that come to mind. Like, why why would I do this over soldiers? Uh, I don't know. Mm -hmm. But uh, I do think that Colossus Hammer with some of these cards is kind of tight. That is true. Maybe not for modern because modern is a pretty damn powerful format and i don't know how many you know like three mana nahiri type of things you want like nahiri with uh cigar's aid is pretty solid right and they played core outfitter to some degree and kemba's more castable so like that's going to show up at very least well, hold on right? hold on gerald I, I have to i have to stop your train because you you have not done the required podcasting work thus far and laid out the abilities of this card as we still okay. do whenever All we're right. in our top 10 yeah. show I was I was still talking about just equipment in general, but yes, you are okay. right. When I start talking about core outfitter, I should probably yep. read the text. Of this card. Okay, so Kemba, out. Kemba Ka Enduring, one dub, two two legendary creature cat cleric. Whenever this or another cat enters the battlefield under your control, attach up to one target equipment you control to that creature. Oh, I guess it's a little different. Okay, I'll get into that in a bit. Equip creatures you control get plus one plus one three dub dub. Create a two two white cat creature token. So this equips the thing that you play, whereas outfitters like equip this thing that's already in play and hit you. Yes. Yep. Okay, different. so that's much worse. But uh, and you gotta have a, you gotta have to have a cat as well, which you know there's cats out there. Oh, I was thinking like if this itself triggered and attached. Yep. Then that would be that's just core outfitter, right? But it is not that. So Kemba itself can pick up a hammer, but then it just like sits there. Sits it's there like with the hammer. Very yeah. bounced or whatever. So, yep. okay, not ideal, but uh, I don't have the text in front of me. I'm just going to say that Nihiri works. I'm going to be confident about that. That was the guard as eight is still fine. Seems like it should. Could be wrong, but whatever. Uh, so yeah, maybe, maybe not modern level, but there's been some pioneer stuff that's, been like all right i'm gonna play a bunch of like really bad cards to try and 20 you with a hammer and i think that some of these cards are like a little bit better than the stuff that they were playing before and does that make it good mm, probably not 
you know, but it's closer. And then for standard, again, have not done like the requisite deep dive or anything, but well, at least we have the tools now, you know, it's there. And I, w- I would be kind of shocked if it got this much support, like actual good support. And then there was just nothing, like nothing remotely playable. I would be shocked as well, but we've been down this road before. These equipment decks in particular always come up short. I hope this is the time where we finally break the curse and we do have an equipment deck worth looking into uh, at the very least in standard. Like you should be able to get this up to a standard power level, right? You would think so. And before it was always like, oh, you have one three mana payoff and a bunch of crap, right? Now you have two two mana payoffs. Jor Kadeen, first goal warden. Not going not gonna to read these secondary cards, but just know that there's another equipment payoff. Uh, like. You have two two mana payoffs that are both solid, and Jor is good enough where it might see play indexed with no equipment uh, if you want to be Boros Agro. And then mm. Nahiri is pretty aggressively costed. So uh, that with all these other equipment that are also fairly reasonable creatures and like white and red, there's no shortage of like good interaction, removal, sideboard cards, etc. So uh, I'm hopeful, but if I get burned this time, Brian. This I'm, I'm off forever. This, this is the one chance they have to get me where I'm going to build an equipment deck and just it's going to be garbage. I'm just never going to trust again. You're a better person than I am. I wouldn't even give them another chance, hence their exclusion from my top 10 list. But I see what you're getting at. This does look like a step up. I understand how they've baited you here. I, I just don't want to see your heart broken again, Gerald. It would be very sad if I have to see the equipment creatures just ruin your day one more time. To be fair... I kind of know what I'm getting into. Okay, yeah, you, you are, know? you're a grown-ass man. You're making your choices, and I, right. I respect that. I, I have hated on this for so long that I don't expect it to be good, but I'm just like, maybe. This is, this is worth exploring. I wouldn't be doing my job if I didn't say, like, hey, this stuff looks appealing, right? Mm-hmm. And am I going to craft these cards on Arena? I don't know. It's hard to say. Um, but I'll probably have to just to get it out of my system and just to make sure. But if I get let down, I won't be shocked, you know, I'm not going to get all like Pikachu faced at you. Okay. Okay. As long as you know. Oh, I know. I know. But I mean, look, there's so many cards and they all look so good. Um, gotta be something there. If not, who knows? uh, number nine, what do you got for me? Let's go. With Tablet of Completion, that will be our number nine card. I would not have this at number nine. Okay. Tell me why. First, tell me what the card does, and then tell me why. I'm going to control F and then tell you what the card does. Uh, Okay. Tablet of Completion is a two mana artifact. You can tap it to put an oil counter on it. You can tap it to add colorless. Activate only if this has two or more oil counters on it. You can pay one and tap it to draw a card. Activate only if this has five or more oil counters on it. Treasure map time, baby. Uh, I didn't like the bank buster. Well, I didn't like the maze mine tome comparison to treasure map. I didn't like the bank buster comparison to They're treasure all map. treasure maps. Every one of I them. I certainly don't like this one. Uh, I, can't, I mean, the, the treasure map thing, like the actual card advantage thing, seems so far off, right? Mm-hmm. I mostly like this as a mana rock. Okay, but, cool. But... Uh, if, if it was just like, doesn't do anything for a couple turns, then it's a mana rock. And then 10 turns later, you draw a card with it. I would not be super high on this. The reason that I am like medium plus high on this is simply because of proliferate. Yeah, definitely turns this up. Uh, you know, the, the time frames you're dealing with on this card are, they're long, they're, they're long time frames. You have uh, a couple turns, so you benefit from your mana rock. So you better be doing things on your three and four mana turns. Otherwise, you're just like, you could have just played the three mana rock instead and got the instant payout. Um, so you you sort of want to build around a very specific curve with this. But a lot of that math goes out the window if you're just pro- proliferating anyway. If you're happily moving up the curve. And then you're getting to this very, very powerful tome effect in the late game. Uh one mana to draw a card, that's a steal. That's, that's about as good of a deal as you're ever going to get. It's just the fact that if you're doing this fair, you're not doing that for, you know, six, 
seven turns sometimes and that scope doesn't really work in a bunch of matchups some it will for sure and like the slam dunk sideboard card in my eyes you'll definitely find plenty of spots where this is a sideboard game changer um but you're right that proliferate sort of brings it into the realm of this is always viable always something i can build an entire archetype around so hold on though compare this compare this to a three mana mana rock again Mm -hmm. what's the difference your fourth turn right no you play this on two tap get an oil counter yep three get an oil counter four where did you get five mana okay so it is your third turn not having access to plus one a lot of decks don't use that no, 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 because you're spending the three mana to play the mana rock. So if you have like a voltage surge or a duress or something you want to cast off it, that's fine. But otherwise, you're just wasting turn three instead of turn two to accelerate mm-hmm. on. Yeah, turn yeah. Four. yep. So in my mind, this is just if you're in the market for a three mana mana rock and you don't need, say, the filtering or the ability to put a card in your graveyard from like Celestis, right? Then. This color, card is color mana as well. That's another sure. huge yeah, limiter yeah. of this. Yeah, that's fair too. Uh, then this this is just a better three mana mana rock. Okay. Because you also have upside and like kind of the thing that sort of put me over the edge is like, well, it's two things. There's a the big thing is there is a deck that saw play in standard that I would have played this in already, mm-hmm. which was the is it sort of like ramp into the uh the big artifact cards that you can split cost yeah right like yeah, that deck yeah I, love I see the home yeah this alongside power stones just a little bit of redundancy very quickly getting to that threshold where you get your absurd prototype cards online sure prototype yes uh so definitely would have loved to have it there because that deck looked a little slow a little clunky right mm-hmm. and the other thing like i mentioned is proliferate and there are a lot of other cards uh on the list that we're going to talk about uh one of them that i think goes along with this card like basically must not must i guess but like will especially in those is it sort of decks is the monumental uh facade which is a land the sphere enters with two oil counters taps for colorless and then you can tap remove an oil counter from this to put an oil counter on an artifact or creature you control activate only as a sorcery so like between proliferate and facade you have a lot of ways to kind of like pump up the thing Mm -hmm. without having to just spend five turns doing it yeah i I do think you are able to get to these thresholds much quicker uh given the setup for this set so even if there were not proliferate and that was some kind of other counter that you were putting on this like this is a non-phyrexian set and this is just your generic treasure map that's showing up somewhere else you're not making oil counters I think this card merits a lot of consideration and there's a lot of ways to make this card way better in this kind of context. Yeah. So I think in a vacuum, this card does not look very good, but uh, I think that it is going to look pretty good and it's just all going to be about the cards that surround it, which is kind of why we have to like frame the show in the way that we're doing. Mm -hmm. But I would, I would have had this at like six six maybe five okay eight or excuse me nine isn't that far off like you're still in the bottom half of your top 10 and uh, i'm making a lot of on the fly judgments here gerald so yeah okay all right all right well on the fly give me number eight. Oh boy uh okay let's go you knew it was coming man i know i know i should have start crafting a full list in my head i i feel like you're gonna be disappointed that this is as low but maybe you can talk me into a higher rating let's go with Skrell of Defector Might. Oh my god, this might be my number one card in the set. Okay. All right, Skrell of Defector Might, dub 1-1, one, one, legendary artifact creature. I kind of love all those words. Phyrexian Might, Toxic 1, this thing can't block. Uh, did, we, did we just settle on P for the Phyrexian yes. mana? No, uh, Phi. Got it. Okay, so Phi, where Phi is, you know, two life or a white mana. Uh, tap, choose a color. Another target creature you control gains toxic one and hex proof from that color until end of turn it can't be blocked by creatures of that color this turn so weird slash bad slash legendary mother of runes type of thing uh you know doesn't help on blocking duty or anything but as i mentioned when this showed up in previews uh 
the mother of ruins people that I was scared of were the ones who were like, give my thing pro green attack past your Tarmogoyf. You know, like the people who actually were trying to kill you with it. And I think that that text on this is, it, it arguably forces you to play better in a lot of instances. But uh, it's, it's so cheap. It's so good. Uh, legendary and artifact are both potential upsides. They're both potential downsides too. Mm -hmm. But I like a lot of this. Also, the toxic stuff in white is not bad either. Yeah, I think it's fine. I, I think a lot of times it's just going to add this weird element of pressure that you, you don't have to lean into all that hard to sort of mess up your opponent's plans. And, you know, there is effective life gain in the format for sure. Being able to sidestep that in some very small occasions is going to be quite important. And I think you're going to get there, but especially in terms of like good toxic options that just play well with Skrelv. Uh, Skrelv's got a hive he brings with him and those two cards together start, again, base of an archetype. Like there's something very clear to build around there. And I think multiple directions to go, this could very much be the core of a control deck, which is weird to say about your one drop and your two drop that makes a bunch of other one drops that can't block, but right. <laughs> there, there yeah, is your can't block control deck. Yeah, well, there, there is a way though where like this but, is just but like I'm, all, you know, I'm right there with you. Yeah, it's all happening in the background and like these are supporting some of your higher end things, the four drops, five drops that are very, very powerful in white, particularly if you're protect, protecting them. And then you're just kind of like answering what your opponent's doing, generating some card advantage, and all this stuff is accumulating in the background until this threat becomes very, very scary. And maybe there's just the tiniest touch of proliferate thrown on top, right? And you're just able to get this incidental win condition. You know, maybe it's like white black and you have this splash of Vraska, another card that's very capable of playing the control role, winning games in and of itself. Uh, it's interesting to me and it's a, a really exciting and very different archetype to build. So I'm, I'm with this appearing on your top 10 list. Sounds like we're pretty different in where we think it's going to fall. And that's not really a knock on, on this card. I, I think it's like fine. Um, it's just maybe I think this archetype has further to go than some of the other ones we get to talk about. Well, I, I don't think it is just toxic stuff. And I like the hive scrove itself. Uh, both halves of doom traveler have toxic. Yeah. And uh, <laughs> last week there was like a little snafu where there was like a double striking or a first striking toxic creature that I thought had double strike. There is a two mana double striking one. I just wrote down the wrong mm -hmm. card name. Mm -hmm. uh so that's four cards and there's a midnight haunting in mono yeah. white that's fine uh and then if you start looking into green white like there's a green white uncommon that's toxic too and there's a new blossoming defense-esque spell uh like uh, that stuff seems potentially real to me like when, when you look at the equipment stuff it's like ah, oh, what is this going to kill him like turn five or something turn six and the green white deck is like, oh, like maybe it just kills you on turn four, you know, and like, OK, that's worth looking into. Scary stuff. Yeah, but uh, just Skrelv in decks with Rafine or whatever. Awesome. I'm in. Yeah, it's going to be a nightmare to play against. Absolutely rock solid protection ability requires no uh, no mana left open. I do wonder some of the things that I feel like we are falling trapped to in this preview season is just sort of writing off Phyrexian mana is free. And I, I get that. I like <laughs> No, no, I know. I know. I agree the, with you. The, there is a, there is a two life cost though. And that could matter in, you know, an aggro meta, which we have not had in standard for a very long time. So again, I think that's playing into us just being like, well, two life, who cares? Like, and correctly so. That is not something that has mattered for a very long time in standard. But there are aggressive cards in this set. There is some aggressive potential and if life totals start getting under pressure again, these cards all get a little bit worse. And I, I don't want to skip out on that part of the analysis. Well, you see the hive gives your toxic creatures lifelink. Yeah, it does. And the Skrelv gives your 10 power Rafine lifelink. So it's, it's fine. That, that would be nice. <laughs> it's a nice way to get through it. Uh, no, you, you are definitely right. I am mostly looking at it like it's free, mostly because a lot of the matchups are fairly mid-range and you know the players aren't necessarily running out of gas like yes they are quick to the battlefield and there's a lot of interaction happening uh but it is 
mostly about who you know gets some sort of tempo advantage and is able to ride that and in that case converting life in into tempo is like uh, i'm in you know and then if it gets to the point where it's like well i can't afford to like pay the life to do this thing i mean are you are you actually winning that game is your you know screl that is mostly an aggressive card even helping you in that situation anyway probably, probably not, not. Yeah. uh and th- there are certain things i mean tenacious underdog is a pretty good source of reach yoldred invoke despair like there are definitely a lot of cards specifically black cards where it's just like you don't have a lot of life to give necessarily uh so you you are right it is not free but at least for you know the first three or four turns i'm looking at it like it basically has to be just by nature of like how the games play out and how you need to be playing it's like you don't really have the luxury you have a choice yeah and if if things are going your way and you're able to leverage these cards and get ahead and kind of keep that going uh you know get traction as it were then it won't matter you know so it's not free there are definitely going to be games that are fairly stable uh or like close where it's like uh you know short of mana or short some life or or you're just not going to be able to activate it at all right and that is definitely going to stop but number seven me all right since you presented a list with nine cards i'm assuming there is room for me to uh, insert a card here i added uh i forgot to send you this since i needed a tenth i just added nissa because i knew that you were going to want to put her on the list anyway no i don't want her on the list i want to talk about a different card Uh, nissa would not be on my top 10 list i'm I'm going to insert a card here and we're going to talk about it a little bit is it a reprint it's not a reprint no this is this is a card that was very high on my list one that you didn't have and i think we should talk about a little bit because it does have a bit of a package with it let's talk about exuberant fuse light uh that was one of my six maybes where I couldn't really conceptually come up with a deck that I wanted to play it in, but okay. go off. Well, I was going to hand it to you to hit us with the text of Azuber and Fusling. You're the guy who does that. I'm, yeah, I'm typing the list right now. Okay. Hold on. Uh, I'll, hold on. I'll do it. I'll do it. I'll take one for the team and step up in this scenario. No, I got it. R, R, zero, one, creature, Phyrexian Goblin Warrior, Trample. This gets plus one plus zero for each oil counter on it when this enters the battlefield and whenever another creature or artifact you control is put into a graveyard from the battlefield, put an oil counter on this. All right, so 1-1 one, one with Trample, pretty medium. Some upside, you know, you can pump, you can equip. That would matter quite a bit. That is that is your baseline. The ceiling on this card for a one-drop, I think, is kind of preposterous. And there's a lot of ways to actually get to that ceiling, be it oil counter stuff mattering, uh, and just transferring some oil counters around, proliferating, or the version that I like, just playing the freaking game. And this card as a threat where they have to kill things around it. And what I think is so, so critical about this card, whenever another creature or artifact, there's a tremendous clause missing from that. It's non-token. So you get wide with tokens and this card all of a sudden you're getting a one mana five one with trample six one with trample and you know it doesn't have to attack every turn after it's gotten its free damage from being down early you can just kind of lean back on it let it be a threat it'll get targeted with removal in a lot of spots but you get a two mana removal spell pointed at your exuberant fuse link which has already done one or two damage early in the game you're very much winning that race a card that excites me that i didn't think i would be excited about uh free from flesh this is red instant common target creature gets plus two plus two until end of turn put two oil counters on it like holy shit that is a tremendous boost in output for this exuberant fusling and again talking about there just being archetypes around this stuff stuff like gleeful demolition which i think we're going to talk about in some other context uh can come around with this card there's so many ways for your fusling to just go absolutely nuclear on your opponent do a large amount of damage for a one drop I think this is the most exciting aggro card in the set to me. Yeah. Um, the the ceiling is incredibly high, right? You're just like, how is my thing like a 7-1 trampler for one or whatever? Ridiculous. Uh, but, you, but yeah, you will definitely get games like that. And I, I don't think you have to work super hard for it. Uh, the problem I was kind of running up against was 
in actual dedicated like sacrifice decks or like dedicated kind of like mono red aggro decks i was just like i don't really know what the rest of my deck looks like and mm. this is the the problem slash thing i love most about magic right now is that for formats like standard you sit down to build a deck and there's no shortage of cards that you could include yeah. like you have options for every single thing that you want to try and do which i think is awesome but when trying to do these kind of shows on the fly, I'm just like, okay, this it, I'm not seeing it immediately. Um, so in the context of the sacrifice stuff, I stuck with Gleeful Demolition, which uh, I don't know, maybe we talk about next because I can't imagine you would have it very high on your list. But um, yeah, it just it seemed more in line with what the deck is trying to do, at least traditionally. And maybe they just both go in the deck and maybe the deck slightly changes or... Yeah. Yeah, maybe Fuseling should be on the list instead of Demolition because like that's the all-star and Demolition is like the supporting cast. I don't know. Um, but for outside of stuff like that, I was like, ah, do you really want to like spend time like proliferating on this thing or doing the gruel sort of stuff that seems pretty slow? Like I, I wasn't really seeing it. So yeah, I just I sort of saw it in the sacrifice shell and maybe not really anywhere else, but uh, I didn't do a super deep dive on it, which is why I didn't make it. But ceiling is incredible. Yeah, I think the sacrifice shell is is completely fine. You know, doing Oni Cult, Anvil things, Blood things. There's just so many cross synergies that work really, really, really well with this card. And like I said, it costs one mana, so it just attacking for two on the first turn when you're in aggro, like the first couple turns when you're in aggro deck and your opponent is setting up, that's quite beneficial. Uh, there are no shortage of tokens to throw in front of this thing, so I think you're not going to trade with a full card a lot of the times when you uh, cash it in. But if you're cashing it in plus three damage, four damage, five damage, right. it's done way more than it was supposed to do. Like that's yeah. just far beyond what your one drop is doing. So, or or you just let it sit around. It's like oh, okay, well they have some blockers. Well, I'll just keep doing my thing grow this thing over a few turns and then attack where it's just kind of like a fireball, you know? Yeah, yeah, it demands a, a large investment if you're going to stop the damage. Like, yes, you may have three tokens around, but if my if my guy is a 7-1, like, you want to prevent that damage, you're giving me all of them. And that matters a lot in multiples. Like, this card, when it's down in multiples, can be an absolute nightmare for an opponent. So there, right. there's something here with this card. And I, I actually, like, I tend not to get very excited about aggro cards, but this one does excite me quite a bit. Yeah, it, I mean, four or five power from a one drop and trample is pretty absurd. And like I said, I don't think you have to work that hard for it. No, no. Um, yeah, I guess this this was like the uh, capricious Hellraiser for me, where it's like if it shows up, it's probably only in one thing. And I like this card and the ceiling is high, but I just don't know exactly what kind of impact it's going to make. And I think we were both pretty happy talking about those cards during preview season. We actually got a chance to, mm -hmm. and that was kind of good enough for me. And then if we want to talk about like honorable mentions or things that we were brewing next week, then that's where they would have fit. Yep. I, I think there's that version of this card. And I th also think there's just the version where you just play it and it's totally fine. That's why it's enough to make my list, but we'll see if that actually comes to fruition or you do need to be a little bit more pointed in the direction of this card for it to really uh make it sing but now we can transfer over to a card that is actually on your list and i believe this is our number six spot now let's talk about gleeful demolition because i do think there's overlap here but it, it goes broader than that gleeful demolition uh has a lot of potential to be an important card in this format r sorcery destroy target artifact if you controlled that artifact create three one one red phyrexian goblin creature tokens uh I talked about this last week effectively pulled off the rebirth uh some downsides where they can destroy the thing that you're targeting in response to make it so the spell has no legal targets therefore it gets countered so you will not get the goblins uh but it's also just like a smelt that you get to main deck in yep. an artifact format so that seems kind of cool yeah you're going to be very happy uh you know taking out your opponent's engine with this card and leaving them with three somewhat meaningless one ones versus whatever it was that was going to kill you very easily to say nothing of like you know no, these no, no, prototype no. threats you they don't get the one ones 
You wait, you get the one ones despite destroying their artifact? Only if you control the artifact, you get the one ones. Okay. Okay. Well, this card's even better than I thought. That is, yeah, that is dude, it's not, it's not Swan Song. It's not Swan Song. Yeah, yeah. That that is incredible. And I'm surprised it's that generous, honestly. Like my I've read this card many times. My brain auto completed it to give whoever has their artifact destroyed the tokens. So that is really impressive. Yeah, I wouldn't be as stoked about having the smelt if it was also they got three creatures, not because those creatures are super threatening. Just like if you're doing the red, black sacrifice stuff, it's just like, Oh, well now I just gave you, you know, a bunch of blockers or whatever. Like that kind of sucks. You know, like in your, in your fuseling deck, you just gave them the way to right, prevent you from fusing. attacking for a few turns. Uh, yeah, dude, the card is just awesome. It, no, it's just actual smelt. It's great. Pretty incredible. Smelt occasionally, very occasionally playable in the past, but you add another dimension to it. And a dimension that is like engine-esque in its impact. It is a card you can absolutely build around. I do want to play it with Exuberant Fusling, though that combination seems like a potential plus four for your Fusling out of this card while you're just doing your thing, attacking, getting wide. You know, maybe you're doing battle cry stuff. Maybe you're just generally pumping your team off things like wedding announcement and you know ancillary tokens that are around red white tokens seems interesting to me which is a weird thing to say because it's not an archetype that is like historically all that powerful but yeah there's there's a lot of synergies here a lot of overlap maybe it's mardu tokens right and you're doing oni cult anvil stuff on top of that and these are all very cheap very very powerful cards so now your top end is something like uh wedding wedding announcement and fable of the mirror breaker so you're playing two of the best cards in standard with this engine below it based on these very 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 effective cheap threats ah, you're starting to entice me to play a deck that i usually wouldn't be interested in yeah dude like having all of these awesome one mana cards is such a game changer yeah and it's coming alongside a bunch of fast lanes too which is awesome yeah, good point really good point uh where are we going from here all right, so we're up to number five now, and I, I think it's time to talk about a card that, in a lot of other contexts from my list, I could have very easily put in the number one spot. I think its impact in standard is going to be a little bit less than its impact in other places, but Tyvar Jubilant Brawler is a Planeswalker that really stands out to me in, in every context in which you can cast it. So hit us with the text. 1BG. Starting loyalty three, legendary planeswalker Tyvar. You may activate abilities of creatures you control as though those creatures had haste. Plus one, untap up to one target creature, minus two, mill three cards. Then you may return a creature card with mana value two or less from your graveyard to the battlefield. Uh, combo y elves type of stuff in older formats are definitely going to love this. Divine Druid's best friend. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yep. That no, it's definitely true. Um, Katilda, I think, in yep. standard, possibly Pioneer, another good place for it. And then I also just think like there are green black sort of self mill decks or like graveyard value decks that would have just loved to have a card like this. Yeah, the card is just good. Like I, I yeah. legitimately think it's just like a good card, even when it's not doing degenerate things, which is what really stands out about it. And th like this to me is the most pioneer masters type card in the set where no, this that's, was in a, that's definitely true. Yeah. If this was in a, a special set, I would not bat an eye for a second, e even like uh, modern horizons. I, I really believe it wouldn't have been out of place there as a card that really enables archetypes that have sort of fallen out of favor. And the, the power is there, man, this card in the elf shell and the druid shell, it, it does so, so much in terms of just being sticky, being annoying, and accelerating your combo to preposterous degrees. Also, even if you're not full comboing, but you are doing things like Land War Elves sort of stuff into this, it just ramps you a lot. A lot, yeah. All you uh, really need, if you have cards in hand, you are you won't for long. Yeah. I mean, you're you're going to this is basically a, another mana elf as long as you're able to keep your land war elf in play, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, on turn three, you have five mana. You get to play out whatever excess elves you had just for free. Uh, it's just a really good card, man. Um, Find a way to draw some cards, and yeah, you're just going to blow up. Absolutely. Yep. 
Uh, yeah, the, the three mana planeswalkers in this set, some of them are just awesome. I love them. Three entirely. Uh, number four, we go in, we go in dancing. Yeah, time to dance. All right. Uh, typing. Okay, Mercurial Spell Dancer. One U, two one creature, Phyrexian Rogue. This can't be blocked. Whenever you cast a non creature spell, put an oil counter on this. Whenever this deals combat damage to a player, you may remove two oil counters from it. If you do, when you cast your next instant or sorcery spell this turn, copy that spell. You may choose new targets for the copy. Uh, this card has been kind of a roller coaster for me. Because I was like, ooh, this part's really good. Ooh, this part's kind of bad. Ooh, but this part's really good. Uh, but this card, this part's like kind of bad. Um, and I think I've ended below where I thought I was going to on this. Okay. Well, but it's still I'm, at the number four slot on our list. I mean, maybe you would have done things differently, but like that is that is a very high appearance for a card like this. And a card that I think also fits the Pioneer Masters mold and can can go back into older sets and, and maybe will shine more there, but it seems like an important standard card too, right? Uh I I think I mean it's certainly better in standard than Pioneer. I think Pioneer has so much competition for mm -hmm. the two mana slot, you know? And this is a little slow to get going. And one of the problems I foresee in standard specifically is the the problem where it's like the Seagate Oracle, not Oracle, that was the one three. Uh Seagate, whatever the fake snap yep. was. Yep, I know what you're talking about. I don't remember its name either, but yeah, so it was it was like one U two one. Your next thing that you cast gets copied, and it's like, oh, it's Snapcaster Mage, and it's like, no, it's not, because you just, instead of like playing the spell early and then getting back whatever you want out of your graveyard later, it's like you have to hold on to the thing. You have to pay all the mana up front, and I foresee this having a lot of problems. And the other thing is that I I'm kind of seeing like maybe a lack of things that you actually want to copy with this. You know, like doubling up on a cantrip or a removal spell is fine, but in the context of removal, uh, you know, some sometimes you have like a shock and they have like a five five and a two two, and it's like, well, okay, I can't even like trade this up to kill the big thing, and I can't kill two things, so this isn't even really doing anything for me. Um, or it's just like you have lava coil, they have a four four, and you're like, well, yeah, you know, I need to kill this four four, but I don't get any value here, you know. There's just going to be a lot of situations like that where I'm, I'm I feel like I'm just not going to be super happy with this card, but it's also just like a thing that can't be blocked. And there it's like, you okay, go. Dude, that, that's you know, a game maybe, changer for me. Yeah, it's huge. It's huge because you don't have to work to get this to connect. Right. It's just all built in. And it's also not a hard and fast rule that like you absolutely have to you know, remove two counters from this every single yeah. turn and get value from it every single turn. It's like, okay, just Absolutely. like keep, keep building counters on it. Like save it for later, you know, save it for when you have time to actually like copy your draw spell or whatever. It's fine. Uh, I went through and actually looked at the cards that were legal. Um, and just, you know, I, I was just like on arena on my phone. Right. But went through and like built a preliminary deck where I just added like one of, every card that I could potentially see playing alongside this. And it's a lot. And there's also like a, a mono blue tempo we control deck that is seeing play right now. Mm -hmm. And sometime I had to go up to, to Larian Serpent, like a fine card, but like not definitely not a good one, right? To the point where some of the decks were just cutting it outright. Uh, basically, that deck would be pretty happy to just have a thing like this, like a two mana threat, a cheap threat. And that alone, I think, makes it so I'm, I'm fairly certain this card is going to show up. It is going to see play. But then I was building is it decks with uh, Iconoclasts and stuff along those lines where having some redundancy in your two drop slot would have been nice. Like maybe you don't play all eight. Maybe you play like four and three or four and two or something. But the, the tools definitely exist. I mean, there's Delver still legal, Unsummon. Uh, cheap counter magic doesn't work well with this, but it supports this pretty well. The yep. removal spells are good. Draw spells are solid. At the very least, you have consider type of stuff that you can cantrip with this. And if you want to play something a little bit bigger, you can. So it's it's not a lock, man, but it is it is damn close. And it's not that hard to get this going. I was riding the roller coaster with you too, where I started to like talk myself out of this card. And then at some point, I just had the, 
the come to Jesus moment where I was like, this can't be blocked and it's a two drop. And like, that is actually enough to sell me on this forever. All the, the battlefield clutter, all of that nonsense you get trapped behind in the standard format. This just doesn't care. Like you have to kill this or this is going to bring pain upon your opponent, both in the form of pressuring a life total and eventually turning into card advantage. I think this is an incredible lightning rod, a card that will have tremendous influence over the game if it gets to live multiple turns. And, you know, just a, a card that always dies is not, that's not enough to sell me on it. Like there, there needs to be more to it. But it is because when this card lives, it is so, so damning for your opponent, so hard to play through. And like you said, you don't have to get the immediate value. You can just ha be happy with your two power unblockable thing that is exactly what these blue tempo decks have wanted not only right now but just like forever it's such a good weapon for them where they're kind of achieving all parts of their game plan at the same time they're producing card advantage they're whittling down your life total they're doing so without best investing resources onto the board and just not caring what you do on the other side you do whatever you want mercurial spell dancer is a constant it is coming through for that two damage every turn and that pushes me back to having this card very, very high on my list. And uh, this this four spot feels very comfortable for me. Okay. I think that that's a little high just because of how skeptical I am. Um, and e even if it does see play, like maybe it's not in a tier one deck, you know, maybe it won't see a lot of play. So there's just stuff like that. And uh, the other thing where it was part of the roller coaster for me was finding this card that I just had not seen before. Um, because obviously we would have talked about this during previous season if I had seen it. So I am going to read the text of this. This is Vindictive Flamestoker. Uh, R12, creature Phyrexian Wizard. Whenever you cast a non-creature spell, put an oil counter on this. 6R, sacrifice this. Discard your hand, then draw four cards. This ability costs one less to activate for each oil counter on this. Yeah, I came across this yesterday as well. And I was like, did we just miss this? I, it must yeah. have just been preview timing. Yeah, I don't, I don't know because I thought at some point, like we had everything and I don't know. I thought I went through the stuff up until like the Vraska, the stuff that we missed. So I, I don't know when it's stuck in there, but uh, it's there now. And I've seen art for it. Like it looks like a real magic card. Yep. Uh, but this plays pretty nice with the spell dancer to the point where it's like, they have the same trigger clause, you know, it's like pretty clear that they want you to play them in the same deck. And, yep. and I'm pretty uh, happy to, yeah, and what what card is this similar to, Ryan? Oh Lord! Uh, so the first one I thought of was tr actually Dragon Master Outcast. I don't think that's what you're thinking of in this scenario. Um, no, I I get the comparison. Um, Bedlam Reveler. Okay, yeah, yeah, that's great. That's it is great weird. Comparison. Where uh, I don't know if I mentioned this with the tablet, but tablet's not a great top deck, but the the land kind of makes up for that to some mm -hmm. degree. And this is also not really a great top deck, but depending on how late you are, it's like, well, yeah, it kind of can to, be. If you have, if you have mana, to it's great, this, right? If you have to sack this for five mana, I mean, that's fine. Four cards is a lot, dude. Yeah. It's a lot. Uh, but if you get this on turn one, comically easy to blow this up. Oh, yeah. So uh, I don't think that this fits everywhere. And then it's like, flame stoker and spell dancer and uh young pyromancer clone and how, how many Jin, like yeah how many, how many do you support right which ones yeah. do you actually want and it's weird because it's like well maybe i'll only play three of this but like you also really want it on turn one so i think you're kind of priced into playing four yeah yeah i, I want to see how little i can get away with it like, can i actually just go flame stoker delver spell dancer like two iconoclasts and that is that's the entirety of my threat base and i am keeping mana up on my opponent's turn always and i'm super annoying to play around and i have card advantage and i have removal and that would be an incredibly incredibly exciting archetype very much in line with my favorite legacy decks of all time right um, and you have you have things like spell pierce and shore up and <laughs> just like all this cheap interaction that is so good with all of these cards. If only uh, we had some kind of, of like mana leak type effect, Gerald, maybe that would be enough to really push this into the Yeah, it's make disappear, Brian. Make oh, disappear. okay. It's, it's okay. good with the Iconoclast. Yeah, that'll do it. Uh, also have this one, Bring the Ending, mm -hmm. which is 
Uh, I'm I'm gonna read the text from memory. Should I try that? This one seems pretty sure. simple. Sure. Yeah. See what you one got. One U, instant, counter target spell unless its controller pays two, uh, and then if they have three or more poison counters, you counter the spell directly. That fits with my memory of this card as well, and I I think this card is actually a house. I, I think this card is is straight up awesome. Solves it's a good. lot of the problems that these conditional counter spells have if you are playing on theme obviously in most cases if you're not you'll just do make disappear instead which is fine i i don't object to that um but but if you are on theme and you have your counter spell on turn two which is always just actual factual counter spell because they're not going to have that additional amount additional mana and then when you hit turn four or five you just have counter spell again because you've done the work to get your opponent three poison counters that's a really, really big deal. That is a level of control over the game that you typically don't get to exert these days in standard scenarios. When formats skew in such a way where Disdainful Stroke is one of your better sideboard cards or like you get to play a cheeky copy main deck and get away with it, you know, like the two mana hard counter spell is so good. Mm. And... I, I just I feel bad for all the folks who have been casting the cancel variants over the last few years, you know, but I really hope that make disappear, you know, it it's doing a lot of the same stuff where it's like a miscalculation that doesn't quite go dead, right? Like if you want to work for it a little bit, you can't. Sometimes you have to sack like your your goblin shaman that's making treasures or whatever to hard counter the thing, but it just means that your thing your is options. a hard counter your if options. you want it, right? Yep. And I don't know how realistic this is, honestly. There's the the two mana cantrip that uh, gives a poison counter. There's a lot of reasonable proliferate stuff. There's an anticipate that just has proliferate tacked on, which is great because anticipate was not even close to playable. Uh, so I don't I don't know how quickly you can do this, how much you want to do this. I don't know if you're talking about playing this in kind of like blue white with some of the cheaper toxic stuff and like actually you know, trying to. Yeah. And, and the hive that's, that's pretty interesting to me yeah you could do that um or if you just want to do the i gotta find that cantrip card and give them one and then proliferate a couple times then all my cards are online i mean i think that's doable i really wish that there was another card and maybe there is maybe i just kind of missed it like one that's sort of free to play that you'd be happy to play that could get the party started where you could start proliferating but Maybe you do just have to play some toxic stuff alongside with this, but you don't have to go full on like here are, you know, 20, 25 toxic creatures. And- no, I don't. I, I think you can literally just use Skrelv and the Hive. When I talked about like a control deck being built around those cards, that is what I'm envisioning. Like they are there to turn on your corrupted stuff. And well, to, at, at to that point, and- at that point, you do the Doom Traveler instead of Skrelv probably, right? Sure, sure, sure. Yeah, like I'm over, I'm oversimplifying. Like there, there can yeah. be a little bit more top end there, but. Small, small package is just what yep. you're saying. Yep. Uh, doesn't have to be super huge. Uh, and then I looked at the black options and it's like you have a typhoid rats on one. And I think that was about it. So mm-hmm. it, it definitely looks like white is the place. Interesting place for a blue white control deck. Yeah. And then a uh, card that I'm more excited about, but is less good is distorted curiosity which is divination but cost too less if your opponent is corrupted which if you get that going that's incredible um i i would be more excited for bring the ending if make disappear didn't already exist you know Mm -hmm. what i mean Mm -hmm. but it you know bring the ending would make me want to jump through those hoops if i needed that effect uh if make disappear didn't exist but now i feel like i'm just gonna do make disappear stuff unless I'm already trying to do toxic stuff. So it's kind of weird, but distorted curiosity is the one where it's like, damn, this is like actually powerful if we can make this happen. Yeah. And I don't think we mentioned, but these two cards together are going to form the backbone of our number three slot, distorted curiosity and make disappear maybe a little higher than I would like, Uh, you know, sort of the problem with doing this on the fly. I might've dropped these a little bit lower on the list, but still an important combination, I think, and one that can matter in standard for sure. Yeah, I agree with that. Uh, Distorted Curiosity is the one that I think works the best with Spell Dancer as far as like 
Yep. One mana draw to you copying this seems super sick, but I don't think that there's a good way to splice spell dancer in with like toxic stuff or the the cantrip give your opponent a poison encounter thing like that thing that that whole thing seems like too clunky to me i don't know man screll protect your spell dancer doesn't sound that bad to me and no if you want to do a little bit more than that i guess to turn this on but if you want to do blue white then yes but then you kind of run into the problem of what sort of defensive tools are you spell dancing besides mm -hmm. fading hope? Because a lot of the good white removal is actually just insane. that's a good point. That is a very <laughs> good point. Yeah. So uh I yeah, I didn't fully go down the rabbit hole yet, but it's it's definitely worth doing, especially since it's keying off of non-creature, not just instants and sorceries. So you can do stuff like Scrolf's Hive and actually figure that thing. Mm -hmm. That's very cool. So it, it's yeah, it's possible. And it's like these these things are like kind of segmented but also open-ended to some degree you know what i mean it's like yeah you have proliferate but it works well with the oil stuff and you have this sort of spells matter stuff but it kind of works with some of the like toxic stuff that's going on too and i i like this a lot man dude you know what i want from this set block constructed i just want to not have to worry about all this other like ultra powerful bullshit and actually get to explore these synergies which are very cool like, I, I guess not quite block constructed. Like, I want to choose like 20 specific cards that I can also add to the format to round out all these decks. Um, but just just let these lower power things shine a little bit and get to explore all this stuff because some of it is going to get lost under the pressure of like, you know, Fable of the Mirror Breaker, uh, Wedding Announcement, Shieldred, that Invoke Despair, all this stuff, very, very powerful. And a lot of this will not line up in that context, but man, it would be cool if just all this stuff was explorable. What about after rotation? Maybe, maybe that's true. I don't, I don't know exactly where the rotation spot lies. Uh, is it calendar year? Is that how we do it now? I don't know. I used to know how many sets were in standard. Now I just don't yeah, anymore. I, I don't either, to be honest with you. So weird. That is that. That's end of it's an a era weird thing to say. Right yeah, I know. Yeah. I know. All right, uh, number two. I know where we're going. It's Hit it's me. big green monster lands. Yeah. Uh, Ty Tyranax Rex. Tyranax Rex? What was the the old dinosaur? It was Tyranax, right? In like scars. Oh, you're ass if you're asking me how to pronounce things, you're literally wasting your time. Yeah. I'm wasting everyone's time, I guess. Uh Tyranax okay. Rex. Four GGG, seven mana total, eight eight creature, Phyrexian dinosaur. This can't be countered. Trample, ward four, haste, toxic four. Uh yeah, without haste, what, what without ward, this card? Like without can't be countered, yeah. without trample, it would be pretty different, but it's got all of those. Yeah. So full, full freaking package, man. I mean, this card seems like a nightmare to play against. And like, like we talked about this card at length on our previous shows. I do think this is a card that is answerable. You can shape a format around it pretty easy, and then this card becomes much less of a threat. But if you do not respect this card, it's just going to win games. It's it's not a beatable card in so many scenarios, and it is going to uh, maybe ruin some otherwise very interesting games, which is sort of a shame, but also games do need to end. This reminds me of some other things that had this spell can't be countered clause and were very, very difficult to answer. Something like Holebreaker Horror actually comes to mind as a very good comparison with yeah. Rex. And, and granted, you know, that card is still around and doesn't see much play anymore. But the context of like how that just overwhelms games versus how Tyranax Rex overwhelms games, very, very different. And it is possible that despite the fact that Holebreaker Horror is not finding success right now, this card can... And what it does, it is just demanding of the entire format paying attention to it and shaping itself around it. Holebreaker Horror at least had that that one turn one window. Moment. Yep. Uh and then if you didn't do that, all right, you're you're probably dead. And the Rex maybe has that window because it's still, you know, quote unquote, only ward four. So maybe you can go for the throat this thing but no, this is going to be played on turn five honestly i know <laughs> like, like they're, the they're, gonna, they're gonna ramp into it and that's what i'm saying is maybe you get a turn after like you get punched in the face for eight right and then maybe on your next turn you can pay six mana and kill it but with hullbreaker horror it was like all right maybe i play my haste creature get in there they play 
hole breaker and you get to kill it and you know you're you're in a good spot but with this it's like you get fireballed and then you have to spend your entire turn to kill it and that's if you like draw your sixth land or if it's yes. like not a fast land or something yes. if everything oh, works no. out you might get to kill it and you have the exact two mana removal spell you need yeah but generally against decks like that they're you not should. giving you a ton of targets but yeah, yeah. If, if they're built around uh the one drop mana creature or the two drop mana creature like you know there's a lot of good versions of that stuff maybe they're like tie barring whatever yeah Oh, what if I had like a really good way to counter removal spells that scale throughout the game? Something like that might even make an impact on Tyrion X or X and how aggressive uh, it is. Yeah, th- I mean, that's that's a tall order, right? It's you're investing so much to get to your seven mana card. Are you then also going to have Blossoming Defense left over? Mm, if the Blossoming Defense, say, has an X attached to it, that could also be a fireball in the late game. I may consider it. And there happens to be exactly that card, Tyvar's Stand, which probably like in a raw power context would have made my top 10 list that it is uh x g instant target creature you control gets plus x plus x and gains hex proof and indestructible until end of turn my plan with this is not to protect my tyrannic rex it is just to like have this card be very good very versatile protect things like my mana creatures or you know whatever my my two drop or three drop are and maybe get a little extra value out of it maybe win a combat that i wasn't supposed to win and really mess up my opponent's plans this card just does a lot and then you hit this tyrannex rex spot and if you happen to just like have one of these floating your opponent can't win anymore they just can't like if yeah. you have reached that state in the game they cannot defeat you no it's true and maybe you just have enough incidental trample things where playing yeah. Uh, an X pump spell is is just good enough too. I agree. Right. I think this card is flexible enough to offer you those kind of options, whereas usually these effects are very, very narrow. This card is anything but. It kind of does everything. No, it is It is definitely good. Uh, and it, it's so versatile in that it gives X proof and indestructible. Mm-hmm. Uh, so you're protected from spot removal and sweepers and stuff. And you didn't necessarily always get that. You were hoping for like the plus two plus two to like get you out of anger of the gods range type of stuff. And yeah. now, now you're just kind of getting everything, which is great. Yeah, pretty important card in the context of these mono green setups. So, you know, find a find a little bit of ramp, find a, a nice middle of the road suite of threats to transition you to this Tyranax Rex late game. And I, I think you have a card that demands respect. Yeah, find some other trampling friends too. Mm-hmm. All right, number one. Uh, I kind of hesitated to put these cards in top 10 order because I didn't know what my number one card is. And this is one of the ones that, unlike the equipment stuff where if I get burned, I'm kind of expecting it. But like this, I just keep coming back to is like the three mana Planeswalker space where it's like, mm-hmm. oh, well, yeah, I was burned last time. But like this one looks good. Like surely it is. Uh, I could get burned again. I, w- I want to put this in number one probably. But uh, Jace the Perfected Mind. Uh, two, you, Phi, loyalty five, legendary planeswalker Jace completed, plus one until your next turn up to one target creature gets minus three, minus O, minus two, target player mills three cards. Then if a graveyard has 20 or more cards in it, you draw three cards. Otherwise you draw a card minus X target player mills three times X cards. In the standard context, this is the easiest card to see as like a game changer archetype creator uh standard definer it is it is very good in multiples it is very good at all stages in the game it is a standalone win condition it is a non-standalone win condition where it just combines with other stuff you could be doing very well it can be an engine generator where it makes this progressive milling effect and you're able to benefit then from using your graveyard it kind of does everything all in a package of like this is just a three mana planeswalker that sticks around and you know is a soft removal spell but a, a decent one one that actually has some uh weirder influence on the game where it can kind of pick its targets and move around which can often be quite important and yeah i i understand the hesitation with this card and you know i also hesitated to have it as my number one card i think like the question for me between like tyrannax rex and this was pretty real but ultimately this is the one that just kind of expands the range 
of standard the most. It affects what standard could be about more than any other card in this set. And I think that is what is supposed to turn it into the number one card. It's also interesting where a lot of the blue stuff that we're talking about has creatures that are keying off of non-creature versus instant and sorcery, whereas mm -hmm. your young pyromancer deck would play. I, I played some Liliana of the Veils in yeah. my uh, PT Rivals deck, but I wasn't happy about it because it didn't synergize with Young Pyromancer. It didn't synergize with Bedlam Reveler, right? But it was good with Souls. I needed an Edict. I needed another kind of like sticky threat against mid-range and control decks. And now it's just like, well, if you want to play a three-mana Planeswalker, it just works with all your cards. So uh, you, you just get to do that, which is great. Um, again, completed. The Phyrexian mana is not free. Uh, it, it is going to matter at some point, and I want to say that this card is much worse if you have to cast it for four, but getting the extra loyalty can also potentially be pretty powerful, pretty strong. Turns so, into more cards in a lot of spots. I mean, God forbid I you know. get that extra loyalty and you're at the, the 20 cards in a graveyard threshold, which, what is your sense of that threshold? Like, how achievable is that going to be? How much is that influenced by the fact that, like, Jace is a card now and sort of builds to that threshold naturally. Um, and I think you're you're probably milling yourself in most instances. Unless you're can see spots, killing them outright, yeah. Yeah, I could, I could see spots where that turns in the other direction for sure. Like, uh, or, or spots where you just like, you have a Jace at like a medium loyalty total and you draw your next Jace and your best play is just like ultimate on yourself, put nine cards in your graveyard Right. and play your next Jason immediately draw three like that yep. should be a very common play pattern yes i agree with that uh i would say an average game is not going to naturally get to that state where a player has 20 or more cards but if you are aware that this is a thing that you don't it's not your plan a but it is a thing that you are tangentially aware of as the game goes on especially depending on the matchup where maybe your deck is going to want to get to a point where they have 20 cards in the graveyard. I mean, that's going to affect how, how you build your deck and what kind of cards you include and how you play the games potentially too. So yeah. I, I think beforehand, you it's pretty easy to point at it and say, well, I never had 20 cards in my graveyard in a game of standard. It's like, well, yeah, but you also didn't have Jace to think about. But now that you do, uh, it's, it's going to be way more reliable. And also Jace just does it. You know, uh, I, I think it's going to happen more so in the scenarios that you're talking about where you go Jace into Jace. And that's not a thing that I think you're going to try and set up. That's very much going to be when the second Jace is like the last card in your hand. Yeah. Right. And you just have a bunch of mana left over. And it's like, well, yeah, this this play is good because I have nothing else to do. But if I had anything else to do, I'd probably be doing that instead. But, but that's that's a huge part of the appeal of this Jace to me is yeah. that like the playing four copies makes a ton of sense. Like it, they are just so complementary to each other. And a lot of times it's hard to play four copies of a Planeswalker. Like it just gets a little, a little mucky. It can really uh, slow you down and leads to a lot of dead spots in your curve, in your hands. But this exists at two different points on the curve, which is very nice. It plays very well with itself. It is somewhat cumulative in its effects. Like again, weird play patterns you could potentially offer me which i i didn't think i'd be leaning towards is something like late game play a four mana jace ultimate on your opponent play a four mana jace ultimate on your opponent you just milled 30 and yeah. now they're they're dead like again i'm not building my deck in such a way to do that thing but because this card is so good in multiples i do think scenarios like that are going to come up from time to time i agree i think so too and Building decks over the last year or so, I I don't think, I can't think of a scenario where I included four of a specific Planeswalker. Like, mm -hmm. I, I might have started with four Kaito or started with four Emperor. It always drops down. I always trimmed them because there were just always situations where drawing multiples was not ideal. It was not a thing that I wanted. It wasn't a thing that I necessarily wanted 100% on curve uh, in every single game, right? Yeah. But I think in a lot of these decks, you are going to want Jace on three, mostly to just like start taking control of the battlefield and to start ramping up that loyalty and maybe get it to a spot where you can like minus the Jace on yourself 
leave it at two or three loyalty and then cash in for cards on the next turn and like see where you can go from there. Yeah. Um, and then, yeah, drawing, drawing the second copy of Jace isn't necessarily that bad. So I really love how diverse the play patterns, like just in this conversation, how many different play patterns right. have we discussed? It, like, yeah. it, it really feels like a very creative card in the same way that Jace, the mind sculptor and even OG Jace, like the best versions of Jace have always been very creative cards that inspire you to play in sort of unique fashions and, and Dude, find these really Jace cool Bellerin. lines. Jace yeah, Bellerin, Jace Bellerin is a hallmark of that. Just blew my mind. I, I, I would guess that if you sampled a reasonable amount of like grinder esque players or like PT players or whatever, the vast majority of them would be like, oh, that card was unplayable. It was like never any good. And disagree. Yeah. That's the thing is like once you figured it out, the card went from unplayable to like, oh my God, this card is just unkillable howling. Unbeatable. Yeah. And it, I don't know. It's so funny, man. It's like there was a period where I put Miko Koro in a bunch of different decks, just sort of incidentally. It was like, oh, my Boros Burn deck needs a little bit of staying power against blue black control. And so I had like a Miko Koro main and one in the sideboard. And you would just get into scenarios where they're like this wall of counter magic, right? But if you, you could like Miko Koro up to a hand of burn spells and then just like fire them off in a turn and on your turn, like you could just never lose to them. Mm -hmm. and then there was a blue black control deck where i played miko koro with kagamaro and it was like making the kagamaro good or big you know but also it was just like good in the deck so i should have realized the power of giving both players a card is like not that big of a deal if you know the, the you reward is worth it or yeah. if you're better set up to deal with it Yep. And for whatever reason, whenever I played Jace Bellerin, I was like, well, I don't, I don't want to give my opponent a card, so I'll just minus it. And then it's like, oh, my Jace died. Well, crap. But then you start playing these games where like, you know, oh, this, this is not good in the fairy mirror because you minus it and they attack with mutiful. It's like, yeah, that's true. So you plus what, it. What if you plussed it? <laughs> what you if you plus plussed it? it? You both get a card and then you have unkillable Howling Mine. And what yeah. are they going to do? Like, spend two mana over like four turns to try and whittle it down when like clearly at some point you're going to find a terror or like have your own mutiful vault or vendillion click or you know come on jace beller yeah. was absurd absolutely absurd and uh you know this card obviously very different but that flexibility no, is there yeah it is it is but like it, it's just one of those things where on its on its face it doesn't look like it's doing anything all that special and I think there are a lot of cards like that, specifically Planeswalkers, honestly, where it's just like, oh, I don't know, I play this thing and I always lose with it. And I think that there were a lot of people that had that experience with Jace the Mind Sculptor because they're just like, oh, it's a brainstorm stick. You just brainstorm every turn. And it's like, yeah, I, I don't know. Uh, we're playing it differently, you know? Yeah. Um, I'm using the abilities all pretty equally, actually, and getting a lot more mileage out of it as a result. And I think looking at stuff like Jace the Perfected Mind, it's like you see all the potentials and dude, especially like the weird setups where it's like, all right, I'm going to uh, minus on myself for like two this turn to put six cards in my graveyard because next turn I'm going to like cast Consider and this removal spell and be able to minus my Jace. Sounds great. Sounds also, exactly what I want to be doing. Also, dude, if this kills your Jace, you only need 19 cards. True. Very true. Right? Yeah. Because you minus two, the Jace dies, it checks on resolution, just for if anyone was not getting what I was implying there. Man, that seems that seems very easy. Like very, very easy to hit that threshold and just have this ridiculous minus minus two draw three cards bot on your side of the field for the rest of the game. Yeah. Uh so I don't know. Like, card's good, it's got a lot of options. Uh looks looks pretty similar. And like maybe plays kind of similarly to like Vrin's Prodigy, the backside of Vrin's Prodigy, mm. which I think was also just like a very underrated thing too. And I'm not, yeah. I'm not saying they're the same thing. Obviously, Jace VP is one of my most beloved cards of all time. All right, this this is no JVP, but it's it's similar. I think where you still look at the text and you're like, I don't know, it's not like killing their stuff. It's not you know doing X, Y, or Z or whatever. It's like yeah, but it's gonna have such a profound impact on the game 
the way it plays out. But that said, uh, there are things like Rafine is kind of annoying against this. Mm-hmm. Uh, goblin shamans from Fable are kind of annoying yeah. uh, because you don't care about the damage from the shaman. It's like them getting the treasure. That's the worst part about it, right? So going wide off uh, wedding announcement, pretty annoying. So there are definitely more things that make this less palatable than, uh, you know, other three mana planeswalkers that might do something similar. But like, I'm I'm still all aboard the hype train for this card. I just, I don't know that I would have had it at number one, but I also have no idea what I would have had at number one. Maybe Skrull, honestly. Interesting. Yeah, I, it, it was close. It was close for me between this and, and the Rex, just in terms of like their influence over the format maybe the more we talk about screll the more i'm like well maybe i just was underrating that card and it should have been higher on my list but we will see and in general i i feel pretty good about this top 10 list i feel like we covered a, a lot of the power points of this format and i can't wait to see how this first week of uh events shapes out and how these cards influence standard I, I wish other people cared some more. I know we're kind of like diverging from what maybe the broader community cares about, but that's really where these cards are going to get to shine first. And I, they're too cool to ignore. So I'm still paying attention to standard. You can drag standard out of my cold dead hands. Yeah, if it was a bad set for standard, but maybe had some pioneer cards, I could totally see us just being like, screw it. We're doing a pioneer preview show, you know? Yeah. Uh, but that's not the case. <laughs> this is like, actually just a bunch of cool stuff for standard in a standard format that was not bad, but could have used some shaking up. And I think it got it. Yep. I agree with that. And I don't know, man, you're, you're pretty happy about our top 10 list, but uh, it does have a car that says equipment on it. So maybe, maybe shelf that maybe Mm. tone down the excitement. It was in the 10 spot. I I can live with it. (laughs) It was in the 10 spot. Do you think about how good Skrelv is in the equipment deck? No, Skrelv's just good. Skrelv's <laughs> just get, Skrelv's think, good. think about how good Black Lotus would be in this equipment deck. Well, yeah, you got me exactly. there, Gerald. You got me. No, nah, yes. Yeah, Skrelv is pretty damn good for any white deck, except for maybe the, the diehard like, mono-white control decks. But yeah, even then, you might, still, you might still see it show up there. Maybe. I, protecting those fours and fives is a pretty big deal. Yeah, but I, I agree with you. I like this list. Uh, other stuff that I had was like the Hellraiser. Yep. Maybe, maybe Nissa, Phyrexian Vindicator, the Boros Reckoner, uh, Fuseling, which ended up on the list. Sneaky. Boros uh, Rust Vine Cultivator is the one drop oil mana creature, which is slow and awkward, but yeah, I would assume there are ways to mitigate that. And. I like the sword a lot, but I don't necessarily think it's going to show up a ton. I just think that once you get it going, it's really good. And I think that there are going to be a decent amount of creature decks that want to do that. And then Zenith Chronicler is like kind of weird. It's like this it's two mana, three, one artifact creature that whenever a player plays their first multicolored spell of the turn, their opponent draws a card. Interesting. Very interesting. So it was just like, I don't know if I'm playing mono colored aggro. Do I want to play this card? I mean, two mana for a three one is pretty bad, right? It just nowadays, yeah, yeah, it just gets blocked by every. I remember when Blade of the Six Bride came out, we're like, whoa, that stat line, right? Uh, but it just it doesn't cut it these days. But if it's drawing you cards and it can't attack or block, I mean, I don't know, maybe that's good enough. But I don't think I think like Model Black has better options. Just you know, you're gonna play Underdog over that thing for sure. But maybe if maybe for Mono White just normal creatures or whatever, maybe it's good enough. I mean, I think that there are enough gold cards running around that you're probably going to be able to get paid on it, but obviously you want it to be focused on like three mana gold cards, right? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Maybe two mana gold cards. Yeah, so, uh, that's, that's an interesting it. additive list. Uh, a couple cards from my list that didn't quite make it. Armored Scrap Gorger. That's the two mana mana elf that also controls graveyards. Kind of got a little bit of... Uh, it, it sort of reminds me of a lot of cards that I liked in the past because it also scales when it's when it's done its thing. Yeah. I think three times it goes to a three three, so it's got that scaling mana elf thing going on. It's got a little bit of graveyard control tacked on, all enough to make me believe this is a playable card. I I uh, like that card a lot. I just felt like it kind of went under the 
removal sort of bucket of like, well, yeah, this is pretty good and might see play, but is pretty generically boring. I think that's totally fair. The other card, which is sort of the opposite of that, where I think it just has potential to be absurd, maybe even broken in some scenarios. The Mycosynth Garden, this is the artifact copying mm -hmm. land. At the same time, I have no idea what to do with it. Like, I don't have something to offer you right now. But all I was no. thinking was like... We know it's good in Amulet. For sure, for sure. But think about the scenarios where like, you have a deck that is built around an artifact and particularly an artifact that scales really well in multiples. So your whole goal is to set up, th this is stupid and not what you're going to do these days, but like a, a Howling Mind type deck where you're just like stacking Howling Minds, right? Yeah. 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 In, in this scenario, you start with your second copy of Howling Mind in play. It's just there. And then when you find the first Howling Mind, you get your second Howling Mind immediately. And those type of things where these things snowball on top of each other and your entire goal is to just set up this chain of artifacts, um, you know, things like Oni Cult Anvils could potentially fall under this. Just anything that has this cumulative value that adds up over time. If you have the mana base that can support it, you're just going to start with an additional copy ready to go. And that is very, very scary to me. I'm trying to think of... Uh modern day application for this and i'm kind of coming up short maybe me it's too me no, too but, but like something that was like sphere of resistance thorn of amethyst mm -hmm. right mm -hmm. like yeah that would be great uh you resolve one oh, sphere geez. you, you yeah. might be doing that in like older formats honestly that's the thing is I, I think it's just like restricted they're like they're all restricted in vintage like maybe maybe thorn is legal or something but it's like lodestone's restricted yeah chalice is restricted yeah but now you have like it doesn't matter what chalice but like you sort of unrestricted it by putting this card in your mana base right like you're able to whichever one you hit you can now copy yeah maybe maybe that's good enough but i don't know thinking thinking about a lot of the stacks type of pieces like you generally only want one and some of them have yeah. to be waters anyway where it's like tangle wire smoke stack mm. crucible is obviously like pretty dead multiples I think Chalice is actually okay as long as like the Chalice mattered and they would have to remove it with something like Force of Vigor or whatever because then you oh, always... Oh, oh, actually, okay. actually, it's kind of cool with Chalice because you Chalice on one and then you let this be your Chalice on zero, right? Sure. Okay, that works too. Yeah, oh, this that, this cool. is only as a sorcery though, right? No, it's not. Jared, uh, that's the most yeah. fucking batshit insane part about this card in my I, eyes. This is... I thought it I thought it wasn't, but then I was like, wait, there's no way. There's it's no way. It's ridiculous to me. It's ridiculous that it doesn't actually have to happen at sorcery speed. That's why I'm like so excited about but this it, card, despite having nothing to do with it. Yeah, but it does it does tap, so it's not like, oh, it's kind of semi surprise artifact blocker or whatever. Yes. I guess that it, is the it kinda, limitation. Yeah. So it sort of solves itself for that, or if you're copying an artifact that you want to tap to get the ability or something but yeah for something like amulet or chalice it doesn't yeah matter. i'm okay with my chalice being tapped i can live with that yeah uh i mean tango wire was doing that for me anyway so who cares yep yep yeah I, I mean i don't know if that's good enough to make that stuff suddenly good like are you gonna play eight spheres in legacy hell no 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 i, I don't think so but it it does open up some deck building possibilities and if we find a card that is very exploitable uh this this will be the thing that pushes it to potentially problematic or just like best in format type stuff. Having that kind of redundancy is a really big deal, especially out of your mana base. I think Amulet Eating Saga gave it redundancy for finding Amulet specifically. Like obviously you can win games without Amulet. It's just mm -hmm. much easier when you do have one. Uh, and then you have consistency and then the double amulet draws are absolutely ridiculous so playing multiple copies of this in amulet would not surprise me i could see it and it's it's a pretty big power upgrade yeah and if it was just like oh i have my four amulets and then i have to play crap like ancient stirrings or serum visions which are all like pretty bad then i would not be as stoked about it but the fact that you have Saga too means that you're going to consistently have an amulet on turn three, right? Yeah. And then and this that this is, land that is easy good. mode for amulet. You you have your amulet. Everything gets very simple at that point. Yeah, and then you just have this as 
uh, you know, land that was already in play or you play it for the turn or whatever. And then you just have two amulets. It's like, how do you lose from those situations? If you have anything remotely resembling gas, you're just doing busted things. And your deck is all redundant in terms of like it being all gas, like everything finds itself and it, it can just get very silly very quickly. So the, any small consistency piece goes a long way towards just like, I always do this thing on turn three. Right. And Amiel was very good because it could turn to you. Um, but it did kind of like lack that consistency mm-hmm. and it's slowly getting there, which is kind of scary. I'm not yeah. saying it should be banned or anything. I'm just saying like, it's getting really good. You yeah. Know? Especially when it's already been considered the best deck in the format at multiple points through its existence. So very true. Very true. So I don't know, man, I, th- I think that's, that's it. Like you don't need to look too hard for that card. Like, yeah, there are probably other applications, but you're like, oh, I just, I don't see where it fits. It's like, no, dude, that's that's the obvious place. It's yeah, that, that's more in the standard context. Like, I don't know if there's anything to do in the standard, but in, in older formats, I think there's several places where this could find uh, a good slots right now. Yeah. Cool, man. Uh, anything else? No, that's it. Enjoyed, enjoyed this preview season a lot. Really, really good set. Uh, oh, it was good, good. Good job, Wizards. And we get to do this show the top 10 show, like all the previews completed top 10 show before the set is actually out too. Normally yeah. it's like, Oh, we record on Thursday Dude, this now is we're so recording on a, on a Friday. So much, such a better schedule. I had, I had such a better time because of the pacing of it. Yeah. And normally the, sh- the show comes out and it's like, we're making these predictions having played zero games, whereas people have already been playing for two days. Yeah. So then they listen to the podcast and it's like, well, I already know that you're wrong or whatever. It's like, okay, well, <laughs> Not this time. Now you're going to wait to find out how wrong we are. Uh, there was the early access event, but I poked around on Twitch a little bit and like, honestly, didn't see that many people playing. So I don't know. Mm. Interesting. I'm trying to make it through the entire show without saying anything negative about Magic or Wizards of the Coast. So I, yeah, just must have been a All slow right, day. Wrap, wrap it there. Game, 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 game. game. Good luck.